Hey everyone, Cooper here, host of the fine podcast you're listening to. I just want to let you know that the episode you clicked on has a format that is very heavily inspired by a podcast called The Bookening. To be clear, our thoughts and opinions in this episode are our own, but the format is very similar to this podcast. I just wanted to give you a heads up and give credit where it is due. With that out of the way, enjoy the show. Coming up next, Booking It Reads, Fahrenheit 451. Hey everyone, welcome back to Booking It. I'm, of course, your humble and eloquent host, Mr. Cooper Cobbs, and joining me today <clears throat> is myself. I know, it's shocking. Another solo episode with your favorite host of any podcast. And uh, today, uh, we're going to have some fun, you and I. That's how it's going to be today, because Isaiah and Tanner aren't here. It's one of those things where, you know, I kind of announced pretty, I, I mean, I, I, I told the guys we were going to read this book, like, in January, if not December, and I was like, listen, we're going to read this book, and, you know, they're like, all right, all right, all right, and so, you know, months pass, whatever, we're getting close, I'm like, hey, make sure, here's an update, here's what we're recording, read the book, and they just kind of <coughs> conveniently forget to tell me until the last point, or last minute, that, number one, they haven't read the book. Or, number two, they're going on vacation the week that we were supposed to be recording. And so, last week, I'm like, hey, recording Fahrenheit 451. You guys should be reading it. And they're like, we're both gone. And I'm like, okay. Sounds good. So, I waited a very long time to record this episode. It's basically, gosh, less than, no, well, roughly 12 hours until this episode's going to come out. And uh, because I had really no reason to do it since... You know, we, we were doing it together. And also, I'm um, recovering from a cold, as you can probably tell. So, I think, hey, some of our best episodes have been hosted by me when we have when I have a cold. And uh, I think that's the only one I can remember is, like, Call of the Wild, which uh, actually wasn't that good. But I'm sure there are others out there that are, that are good. So, all right, before we talk about the book, though, and I, I do have a lot of thoughts. It's going to be a good episode. I'm not joking here. I'll throw in some jokes, um, though, to make it funny, of course, because I'm funny. Uh, but let's do some updates on... Basically, things that are coming up. So first, where are Isaiah and Tanner, you might ask? They're on vacation. School just ended for us. It's May. I know, we're homeschoolers. We're out. Oh, by the way, first episode we're recording in May. Thank you guys so much. Our our download numbers for April um, on both this podcast, Booking It, and a movie podcast, The Screening, both of those were off the charts, quite literally. They were the most um, downloaded ep- ep- uh, month that we've ever had before, so... It's incredible to see that this podcast um, and our podcast empire to be um, to be kind of uh, loose about it, but it, it's growing, and you guys are sharing with your friends, and this podcast is reaching more and more people, which is really cool and really awesome. Especially as we're coming up on our three-year anniversary, if you can believe that, it's insane. Um, wrapping up year three on the podcast, which is gosh. Anyway, thank you guys for that. Isaiah and Tanner are on vacation. Tanner is in Colorado, last I checked, and Isaiah was in the Midwest somewhere. I can't remember if it was Michigan or Illinois, but it's pretty much, uh, or Wisconsin. That's pretty much all he goes to since all his family is up there. So one of those states, if you're in the Midwest, you know, try to see if you can find him. It'll be like a Where's Waldo in IRL uh, hunt for Isaiah. Anyway, I'll have to say they're gone. They'll be back soon, though, because next thing to give an update on, our 100th episode anniversary is our next episode. Can you believe it? This is episode 99. A uh, very number-related episode, huh? 99 and 451. But next episode is our 100th anniversary of our first episode. Not anniversary, but 100th episode celebration thingamajig. And so what I've wanted to do for the longest time is have <coughs> the famed Gandalf versus Dumbledore debate that we've never been able to have. And I hope that Mr. Matthew, who is a former panelist on the podcast, will be able to join us for that uh, enlightening discussion um, debate. I hope that'll happen. Um, it'll be me and Tanner on the Gandalf side, and Isaiah and Matthew on the Dumbledore side. We'll have a debate. I really hope that'll happen because I think that's be it's going to be really fun and really special. Uh, hopefully, 
he'll be not too busy with summer stuff before that happens. I'll reach out and make sure, see if he can do it still. Because I think it'll be really fun, really awesome. We all want to do it. Um, it's going to be great. But uh, next episode, I don't know when it's going to be able to come out. If Matthew can be on, we'll have to kind of, you know, be flexible and stuff like that. So we, this is kind of our last episode planned before we dive into the summer, at least on booking it. So it might be a couple of weeks before we get the episode. But that's good because you guys get to email us questions about our 100th episode. Or not about the episode, but you get to email us questions. We did this for our uh, half centennial celebration, our last celebration we did for 50 episodes. And so our, our email will be put down in the description of this podcast. But you can also just hear it from me bookingitpod4 at gmail.com. No spaces, no anything special, no numbers, just bookingitpod4 um, at gmail.com. And you just send your questions to that email. We'll answer them on the 100th uh, episode celebration. It's going to be really fun. Send good questions because we love hearing from our listeners and things like that. Next uh, update, we have summer. So we've done different things for the summer. So our first year, we did summer short stories. We read, I don't know, like half a dozen short stories and talked about them in kind of brief episodes. That was a lot of fun. I'm not sure we're really going to have time for anything like that, which is why we didn't do it last year. Last year, me and Tanner just kind of talked about War and Peace for a while, which was kind of fun. But this year, I kind of want to have a bit more structured. So what I'm hoping to do, and I haven't really talked to the guys about this, but is we're going to do kind of like a monthly book club. So for June, July, August, we'll have a book of the month, and we will read that book. And then we, me and Tanner, uh, and Isaiah, if he can join on, will talk about that book. And you guys can send in your questions. It'll be a read-along, right? It'll be really fun. You'll have a month to read it. And I think that I have some books in mind. I think that we're going to do a Jane Austen book. We're going to do a non-Narnia uh, C.S. Lewis book. I think that'll be really fun. And then maybe like Around the World in 80 Days or kind of a short uh, semi-kids book like that. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. I'm really excited for the summer. I think that'll be a really cool way to where we can have some time off to and spend with our families to make some make some dough over the summer, if you will, um, and just have vacation time. But at the same time, getting you some content, getting you some awesome, enlightening discussion because, hey, let's face it, your lives are better when we are putting out episodes. So that's great. Um, I don't know. Hopefully it is. If not, send us an email. But that'll be really fun. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's a great compromise. Leave it there for now. Last announcement. Next year. So, the good news. The podcast will be continuing for another year. So, after this, we will have to permanently say goodbye to Matthew. who hasn't been on an episode in, like, forever. But he'll be going to college. And maybe we'll be able to ask him about that uh, if he appears on the 100th episode celebration. But me, Tanner, Isaiah <coughs> will um, be going into our senior year next year. And funnily enough, it'll be just us three in our challenge uh, homeschool curriculum classroom. So on a Friday, when it's the day uh, that <coughs> we come in to discuss things, uh, that's actually where we're going to be able to record because all three of us will be in a room. Uh, probably going to be, and we're going to be um, discussing the books that we have um, been reading for Challenge, which uh, for senior year for Challenge Four is going to be ancient literature. So it's things like the Odyssey, the Aeneid. Uh, literature like that and it's gonna be more of a close read style since we're gonna be reading like i don't know i think there are like 24 books in the odyssey and we're taking that uh, i don't know a couple, couple books at a time in the second semester so we're gonna be kind of deep diving on the literature that we're, we're gonna be reading we're gonna be recording our class discussion and i think that'll be fun because tanner's mom Miss emily is going to be our director or leader or tutor or discussion facilitator however you want to view it and so she might be able to uh, be on and talk um, and lead our discussion sometimes so that'll be a lot of fun Anyway, that's kind of the way the podcast is going to work. That way we can all have, you know, our weeks to get school done, to work, to do extracurriculars. At the same time, be able to consistently and weekly put out a podcast for you guys. And so if you're in Challenge or you know people who are, next year would be a great time to just kind of send them an episode because we're just going to be kind of, you know, doing an episode week by week on the stuff that we had been reading that week for our school. And so it's a great way to get other people connected. Uh, if you're in Challenge, it'll be a really fun way to get your class connected. I think that'll be really cool and really fun. I'm really looking forward to talking about all that stuff, um, all the ancient literature that's kind of been a foundation for the canon, uh, as homeschool moms like to say, about um, you know the Western, the Western canon and great literature and stuff. So I'm really excited to dig deep into that 
next year. And I'm really excited that we get to give another year of this awesome podcast that we all love doing to you guys. Okay, I think that's all I have. We're about 10 minutes into the podcast, and uh, that's what we've done so far, updates. But coming in to Fahrenheit 451, let me get my baggage. And if this is your first time listening, I mean, first off, congrats on making it through like 10 minutes of updates that, you know, you may not have any interest in. But here we are talking about Fahrenheit 451, and my baggage, or that segment we like to call baggage, is basically just give your history with the book, kind of what you're bringing to the book, your expectations, everything like that. And so what, this is the second time that I've uh, read this book. And I think it's one of those books that a lot of people have heard about for a long time. It's obviously mentioned in the same breath with what I like to call, you know, the, the big three, um, Brave New World, 1984, Fahrenheit 451. It's kind of those, the peak dystopian, uh, totalitarian literature, right? And so it's mentioned in the same breath as that. I've heard the name a lot. And hey, 451 just kind of sticks in your mind, doesn't it? Well, a couple of years ago, I decided uh, to read it for the first time. I can't remember if it was over the summer. I don't think it was. I was just reading it for fun. I finished it pretty fast. And I think my thoughts on it last time will probably be similar to it this time. Um, I thought it was pretty good. I mean, I think that it's not... It will, it's kind of get bleeding into my overall thoughts. But it's not the peak of English liter- literature by any means. I think that even Ray Bradbury improves later on in another book that I've read, which ironically enough we were supposed to talk about and then it had to be a solo episode which was something wicked this way comes uh, i think he's much better than that and it kind of perfects his style um instead of perfecting it here but i thought it wasn't bad either like he makes some good observations he's got some fun characters some fun language so that's kind of what i brought to this read was hey not the best but pretty good and that's pretty much what i got i think that i was a little bit higher on it this time maybe appreciating it more having it studied it post read a little bit more, and everything like that. So I really kind of just came to it um, expecting a pretty good book, and that's what I got. So that's kind of my thoughts on uh, my baggage and just my overall thoughts kind of. But uh, I kind of want to give a little bit of background on Ray Bradbury, um, who he is. He's kind of a guy who you really just kind of end up liking. Like he's been married, or he, sorry, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was married to one woman for his entire life didn't cheat on her, didn't commit adultery, didn't do anything like that, didn't get divorced. They stuck together the entire time. And already, that's like a huge plus for anybody who's kind of famous for creative endeavors. Um, so he seems like a guy that you would really kind of like hang out, hang out, hanging out with. And he's really famous at writing short stories. He's written hundreds of short stories. And he's famous for, obviously, this book is kind of his claim to fame. But he's written other books, like Something Way This Way Comes, like I've talked about, and like his Martian Chronicles and a few others. So mostly a short story writer. Um, he's very, as you can tell if you read this book, not only paranoid, but very apprehensive about technological um, advancements. <clears throat> and so that's evident with Mechanical Hound and the way he treats kind of uh, billboards and new technology. And he, I, I've read some things where he like criticizes earbuds, basically, that he saw at his time. And so... Definitely, if he were alive today, he would uh, not really enjoy the progress made with AI, probably. Uh, that's the sense I gather. Um, but other than that, I think that he's a pretty fun writer. He writes a lot of fun short stories. He's a very unique stylist, which we'll get to in a sec. I can totally just identify him by his style. No problems, no questions asked, just by reading a paragraph or two because it's that distinct. But he seems like a guy that I would like. Uh, I overall do like what he's written from what I've read. I've read two novels now, and I like both of them. And I've read some of his short stories, and some of them are really, really good. He's a really good short story writer. I recommend uh, some of his short stories. But that kind of leads me into my thoughts on the dystopian genre. But uh, before I talk about like my thoughts on the genre, I want to tell a, a funny story. So I was uh, attending a college the other day just to kind of get a sense for it. I was visiting it to see if I would like to attend, possibly. But um, I was looking at their basically student pamphlet that, you know, student writers have published, kind of com- compilation of literature, essays, poems, things like that. Um, because, shockingly enough, you wouldn't guess it for a person who is host of a literature podcast, but I'm interested in writing and journalism or in creative writing or something like that. But I was reading their kind of student-produced, you know, I don't know what you would call it, a pamphlet. And 
talk a lot. I love the opening line. It was it was an older one. It was kind of published in 2020 after COVID had happened, and uh, the the kind of one of the first things that the introduction um, said was, "If you're actually living in a dystopian hellscape, we're s- sorry for <laughs> all the dystopian literature you're finding right now in burnt libraries and uh, bookstores," which I thought was hilarious because it's totally true. I mean, come on, how many dystopian books have been published in the last 20 years, right? But I, I'm kind of really fascinated by dystopian literature, um, not in a bad way necessarily, but I find it really cool. So the word dystopia comes from Greek, shocking, um, topia meaning place, and then dis meaning bad, so just bad place. And it's kind of uh, a separate branch of utopian literature, which, uh, top, again, topo place, and then ut, which actually does not mean good place, it means not place. So the whole idea with utopian literature is actually utopia as a concept can never exist. It's a not place, which I find absolutely um, kind of fascinating and cool because that's awesome. But dystopia is a kind of a subset of that. It's a bad place, often characterized by a corrupt government, um, you know, a government that controls everything, a populace that is either in oppression or is actively volunteering for um, oppression or pleasure um, and things like that. And so how does Fahrenheit 451 kind of fit into all of this? Well, actually, um, I think in the in the back of the book and the things that he's written and evident <coughs> um, even in the book, it's really all about society wanting to end books. It's really all about society as a whole, not just a corrupt government. Like the, the government doesn't really play a part um, a, a, whole, a whole ton in all of this. Like it's the people who, uh, as I think um, – character Beatty, Captain Beatty, kind of goes through this monologue of, hey, the people wanted this. The people who were the, were the ones lynching library and then burning libraries down and burning bookstores and things like that. I find that idea pretty fascinating and different from, you know, I mentioned the big three earlier, 1984. Um, I mentioned Brave New World, things like that, where it's really the government who took control and is enforcing their iron will upon the people, whereas Fahrenheit 451 and the kind of fable that it tells, it's more about books, obviously, but it's more a parable of society and the problems with society wanting to do a certain thing, which I think is pretty cool. So all of that leads into my opening thoughts, which as I said earlier, I think it's a pretty, pretty good book. Obviously it's lasted. It's a classic for a reason. And I think that reason is it's got some cool images, some cool iconography, um, and a, you know, pretty potent message and a relevant message. I don't know I mean, dystopian literature obviously is, <laughs> is successful because human societies have a tendency to devolve into dystopia. And so, obviously, any literature that can accurately capture that or accurately predict that or accurately give a sense of, of fear for what's coming can actively make an audience interested, uh, engaged, and interested in the book. Yeah, uh, I really like the title. I think that if this book was called something different than 451, or uh, if it was a different number, rather, than 451, it wouldn't stick. I think that Fahrenheit 451 is just a classic title. It sticks in your mind. It's really specific. Um, imagine if it was called, you know, 453 or something like that. It wouldn't really work. Uh, that temperature is supposed to be the temperature with paper burns. From what I've researched, that's mostly true. I think it depends on the paper. Um, but, hey, I don't care if it's accurate or not. It sticks in my mind and makes me remember it. So I like it a lot. And, obviously, the opening... Um, opening line, it was a pleasure to, to burn, is a great opening line, it captures your attention, what are they burning, why is it a pleasure, and things like that. Now, my main critique, kind of, is that the style uh, just doesn't quite succeed, necessarily. And so, here's what I mean by that. And I, got, I told you earlier that any, any paragraph you could put in front of me, uh, that's Bradbury, I could probably identify it, because... He swings for the fences in every single shot. He uses what we like to call a lot of dress-ups, and he likes to make his language really fun and throw a lot of adverbs and adjectives in there, and it's really over the top. Um, And sometimes it succeeds, like in uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes. I think it really succeeds. All the imagery that he uses and the language, it actually works. In this book, which is, by the way, it's his first book. Like, come on, bravo. This is, there's not a stronger first novel out there. This is somebody's first book. Like, come on. But uh, his style does over the top here and doesn't quite do it as well as he will do later in his career. And so I think even he would admit that, um, that it's not up to par as where he would be later. But ultimately, it's still, it's still not bad. But here, like, the opening line was a pleasure to burn. 
And I think a good example of kind of what I'm talking about is actually in the opening paragraph. He kind of jumps into, you know, uh, a lot of fun language and fun uh, extreme similes and metaphors and things like that. But here's the line that I want to read you. It's near the end of the book, so spoiler if you haven't read it before. Um, but here's here's a line. It's one sentence, but yet it's like an entire giant paragraph. This is what it says. Montag, falling flat, going down, saw or felt, or imagined he saw or felt the walls go dark in Millie's face. He heard her screaming, because in the millionth part of time left, she saw her own face reflected there in a mirror instead of a crystal ball, and it was such a wildly empty face all by itself in the room, touching nothing, starved and eating of itself, that at last she recognized it at her as her own, and looked quickly up at the ceiling, as it, in the entire structure of the hotel, blasted down upon her, carrying with her a million pounds of brick, metal, plaster, and wood, to meet other people in the hives below, all on their quick way down to the cellar, where the explosion rid itself of them in its own unreasonable way. And so that's uh, actually, in one of the um, <clears throat> afterwards that he wrote for this book, it says that it's one of those jawbreaker sentences that he has. And I think that's a fair description of this. It's an epic sentence. It's an entire paragraph. It's packed with um, words and imagery and symbols, and it's just a lot. And for some people, it's going to rub them the wrong way. It didn't bother me too much, but it's definitely like he's not swinging on all, or he's not firing on all cyl cylinders when it comes to nailing it every single time. Like going over the top can be good. Uh, but sometimes it just falls flat um, and things like that. So I, I think it falls flat a little bit here, a little bit more uh, than he succeeds in some of his short stories, especially in Something Wicked This Way Comes. But other than that, it's got a pretty fun, pretty cool concept, pretty fun characters, and overall a solid story. I, I think another thing that um, may drive people the wrong way or may kind of be off-putting is his use of symbols. So this book is really more of a novella, in a novel and it's divided into three kind of long parts and so the the parts are called the hearth and the salamander part two is the sieve and the sand and part three is burning bright so all of those especially the first two have imagery have symbols have these really kind of like random things like what what is what is this supposed to mean um and so he's very 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 symbolic and metaphorical and that'll drive people the wrong way. Like in a scene towards the beginning, uh, he describes his wife, who actually was talked about in the sentence I read earlier. His wife is basically getting a procedure done to remove some drugs that she overdosed on from her stomach. And he's describing this like machine that they used to take out um, the bad medicine, the bad blood, and kind of put new blood in. And he's describing it like a snake, and he has like this extended metaphor for a page and a half we're just describing this machine as a snake that's slithering in and you know injecting its venom or whatever. Anyway, it's really thick. Um, that's really a good way a good way to describe his style. It's thick with adjectives and adverbs and imagery and symbols and metaphors, and that'll drive people the wrong way. Uh, it'll, it'll rub them the wrong way, and I think that that's okay because like he is going, he's ladling it on pretty thick. Is a, is a good way to say it, and that'll bother some people and others it won't. But I think that despite that, like I said. It's not done the, the, the best way. It's done maybe a ham-fisted way, but it's still pretty solid uh, overall as, uh, as a book. So by the way, if you haven't read this book before, I guess I should kind of this late, <laughs> but say um, kind of the plot of the book. Basically, the society in the future, although strangely 1950s-ish, 50s-ish, which I'll touch on in a sec, but there's a group of people called the firemen, and instead of putting out houses, they're supposed to uh, basically put them uh put, f put light books on fire essentially books are illegal reading them is illegal and he is going all the firemen of which the main character montag is one they have to go burn the books and so that is kind of the plot of the book and then obviously the guy montag wakes up to the matrix not really he wakes up and he sees the horror of what he's doing and he loves books and he finds a mentor character and they try to end it all together and then at the very end oh no the bad city gets blown up but montag has escaped to join a bunch of ragtag people who have instead of you know writing down the forbidden manuscripts have memorized them instead and they've saved all the books because it's in their heads and they're gonna one day rebuild society and copy them all down because it's in their heads so that's funny it's a cool ending but uh let's see here what's next characters so montag 
he's a fun character, kind of. I mean, he's the Everman character, the guy in um, the dystopian novel who wakes up to the horror of his reality and decides to do something about it. And he does that role pretty well here. He is kind of a wild card character. He gets angry at some points. He you know, does things that are rash and reads a book in front of some of his wife's friends. And he burns the bad guys alive with the, the torch that is meant for um, flamethrower that's meant for the books and things like that. So he's kind of a fun version of that. He's overall not a complex character necessarily, but he's still a fun character. He fulfills the protagonist in a dystopian novel solidly well. The most interesting character uh, is the bad guy. His name is Captain Beatty. And he's kind of what I like to think of as Satan when he's tempting Jesus. Beatty has read all the books. He knows what's in them, and he's using using it against Montag. And he's twisting it in a way to where Montag questions everything. And I really like his just attitude and his cleverness and his getting under people's skin. He's really effective, uh, like I said, just being a Satan when tempting Jesus who knows the scripture uh, and he knows what's supposed to happen but is twisting it and things like that. So he's a really cool villain. He's the best character. He's really the only character that is... I would say above average necessarily in this book. He's really fun. He's really uh, enjoyable to watch. But then my favorite part, like I said earlier, is basically where Montag is getting tempted by um, this the bad guy, Baby, and ultimately, instead of just trying to reason with him and quote books at each other, um, Montag just picks up the flamethrower and burns uh, burns him up. So that's a good reminder that sometimes, you know, words and debate and rhetoric, and slinging tongues at each other, not slinging tongues, gosh, what am I doing, uh, Isaiah would be making fun of me mercilessly right now, um, and you know, you know what I'm talking about, the, the, the uh, firebrands that are wielded by men's mouths, sometimes the best solution is just to, you know, flamethrower the bad guy, because, you know, you're right, or punch down the evil guy, instead of trying to reason, um, and, and things like that, so that's a good reminder there, um, other characters of note, his wife, I read, some portions of she's a good just scarer for, i mean not scare but is a good reminder that in the future people might look like this and they're going to be fearful they're going to be doing whatever the bad people tell them to and they're just empty they're just empty people and so she's not a complex character necessarily but she has a good art in terms of just i'm empty and i'm going to die empty and i'm awarding to future to the future then there's the mentor character faber uh, he's a kind of a fun character. I like it because he was a coward. He didn't stand up. So he's the kind of character who didn't stand up to the increasing things that were happening against books and literature. And now he's kind of had his renaissance. He's having a chance again to take revenge and do something to bring back books and things like that. So he's this coward who becomes um, the mentor to Montag, which is a pretty, pretty cool character. He's pretty fun. And it's kind of left ambiguous whether he died at the end. Uh I think it's all the characters that are of note, except for kind of the uh, tramps at the end. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, kind of about the setting. So it's very much a retro future. Imagine, like, The Incredibles or something like that, where, you know, like I mentioned the mechanical hound earlier. They have a mechanical hound who goes out and he hunts criminals, because what do you do back when you're in the 50s and 60s and writing this book? Well, they have hounds that police have to go out and uh, chase down the bad guys. And that's the thing that happens in this book because Ray Bradbury was growing up in the 50s or writing this book in the 50s and the 60s. And all the, the wives in this book are 50s and 60s housewives because that's what Ray Bradbury knew. And so this book is very much 50s and 60s kind of transplanted in the 21st century at some point. So that's something you should be aware of. Some people will be weirded out by that. That's just kind of what it is. It's very much a retro future, although I don't think you really knew that it was that retro at the time so all right well let's talk about the uh, moral or the impact of of this book like most um <coughs> excuse me dystopian novels it's a warning um i think it's a better warning which is why uh, in my mind it's better than the bit i've read in 1984 because it's more practical it's like listen dystopian governments the end of books as you know it isn't going to happen <coughs> because uh, of maybe is it going to happen unless you let it happen. And this book is much more about little sister than big brother, as someone on the Internet told me. And ultimately, we can burn books today by other means than, you know, they do. They did in the book. That's actually what he mentions in the afterward. He says 
point is obvious. There are other ways to burn a book. And now he's talking about, um, you know, the things that of, of even his day that are expounded upon now, which are books are getting burned, not just in flames, but are getting burned in censorship and burned in uh, editorials. Um, he, he writes uh, in the afterward, the point is obvious. There is more than one way to burn a book. And the world is full of people running about with lit matches. Every minority feels that it has the will, the right, the duty to douse the kerosene, light the fuse. And that's <coughs> that's what he says in the afterward. I think that's absolutely true. We see that in the modern day. Roald Dahl is a good example of this. His books are getting edited by editors who f- want to make them more uh, conscious. Um, and, uh, you know, they're sensitive to his behavior, uh, calling people fat and saying that women have wigs are somehow offensive, and they're editing Roald Dahl. And he's like, that's an example of my book. You're not lighting it on fire, but you're clamoring. All the people are clamoring for this to be made less like literature and more like flaming political garbage, flaming politically correct garbage. And so that's what he's trying to make the point with in the afterword, which is a hugely profound point. There is more than one way to burn a book, and society will eventually... Um, unless we do something about, <coughs> about it, be clamoring for books to be burned, not only literally, but also with the tool of the editor and with the eraser and with the ability to rewrite history and things like that. And so I think it's absolutely a poignant warning now and then to be on the lookout for um, understanding that the censorship of the wrong kind of books and the way that we burn books are um, can, can be you know indicative of our society and culture as a large and our tendency as a whole uh, to kind of you know claim that the book needs to be censored or something. Now, I think it's important to say, obviously some books have to be censored. There has to be some kind of standard. We can't just allow you know pornography necessarily to be in every school library because we shouldn't be banning books. Like obviously some books should be banned, and it should like what, where, where do we draw the line? Um, that's really the question. Uh, and I think that Ray Bradbury, Ray Bradbury makes a compelling case that in most cases we should allow books to you know be freely. Um, but like, I don't, obviously he's not arguing, he's not arguing, I think we kind of all know, is what I'm trying to say. Obviously, books with explicit content shouldn't be allowed, and little kid sections in the libraries, and also we shouldn't be banning good literature. And so he's saying, look out for the people who are trying to claim something is offensive, or we've seen it today with, you know, cultural appropriation, like, what the crap, like, can we please, you know, stop editing books and demo- demonetizing books <coughs> and demonizing authors for daring to write in a culture that they were not a part of. That's the thing that this book applies to today. <coughs> and that's why <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> that's why I like this book and I think that's important for everyone to read. And I wish that CC made us read it, but they made us read this weird sci fi novel, Starship Troopers instead, which is Completely random. This book better than that. And anyways. All right. That's my episode on Fahrenheit 451. You should read it. It's good. Donor shoutouts. Hey, <laughs> if you want a donor shoutout, please go to patreon.com forward slash booking it because we have awesome content. If you're thinking about <laughs> joining, you're not sure, let me convince you right now. We have awesome content behind the paywall. We have 15 to 20 episodes completely free if you join up for Patreon, bonus episodes at $10 a month. The Antenna's complete review of The Rings of Power, season one. <coughs> and we have bonus books like The Giver that we've reviewed, some of our favorite books, some books that we've been reading and processing, all that stuff behind the paywall for $10 a month. For $5, you get a donor shout out like I'm about to do. Get your name, shout it out because you're proud to have supported us, which you are. And then just $2 a month. If you support us at $2 a month, you get free weekly con okay i keep saying free for two dollars a month you get weekly content every week that i tanner isaiah we post we have 35 editions of cooper's weekly nerd post where i post a nerd fact that is really cool that you need in your life then we have tanner writing poems and things like that and isaiah and mandalorian helmet you get to see our faces because hey maybe you've wondered what we looked at and you're in, like look like and you're a creepy stalker and you want to find out, well, hey, you can do that over at patreon.com forward slash booking it. You can see what we look like. You can put a face to the mouth, to the words. It's insane. Support us now. It's great. 
you can discuss things with us. You can talk to us, not over email, but over Patreon messaging, over the comment section and the posts. Great. Plenty of people have supported us over Patreon. They completely recommend it. I can speak for them. They recommend it. All right. <coughs> Donor shoutouts. We have... Oh, man. I'm sorry. I need water, but I don't have water near me. So we're going to do a scratchy coughing. <coughs> Donor shoutout. <coughs> okay, we can't. <coughs> I'm done. <coughs> hey, it's me. Back from the dead. No. Back from uh, a coughing fit. I'm leaving that in because I don't want to... Um, go back and edit this, but also because it'll be funny. So, kind of shoutouts. <clears throat> I don't have my uh, phone in front of me, but uh, I think I can get this accurate. We got Nana, Van Papian Wayla, Mike and Sylvia, Mike and Laura, and Jenny and Sam, Moses, Zara, Anna, Emily, Lizzie, Keenan. I said that quietly because if I say it louder, I'm going to cough. Thank you for listening. Support us at the link. Please give us money. Help making this podcast. Oh, man. Sorry, guys. I'll be better next week. I'll be done with my cold. We'll celebrate um, the 100th episode. Send us questions. Send us book ideas for <coughs> the summer um, book club thingamajig. We're looking forward to celebrating, wrapping up another great year here at the podcast, and hopefully we'll be seeing many of you over at patreon.com forward slash booking it. Until next time, keep on booking it.